Hey everybody, Alex here for Nerdy Inc. Coming at you with another episode of Nerd Talk. So you want to know what's awesome? Monster movies, giant creatures that come into your village and destroy your buildings and murder your whole family and basically just ruin everything you love in your tiny, pathetic human heart. We got to thinking about monster movies a lot lately because Jurassic World came out a few weeks ago, which then naturally led us to then compare it to the original, which then basically made us compare it to a whole bunch of other monster movies that we like, and we sort of thought, hey, this could be a good topic for a nerd talk. So here we are with a nerd talk on monster movies. So in the conversation you're about to hear, we pretty much pick apart our favorite monster movies and sort of why we like them. What is it about destruction on just the devastating level that makes us love it so much. And I gotta say, I think we actually come up with a point in this episode. We sort of arrive at a thesis, which is rare, because we usually just sort of ramble until we get tired of talking. Sort of like what I'm doing right now. I'm just continuing to ramble with this introduction instead of segueing to the actual conversation. Hey, how about that as a segue? Here's our conversation on Monster Movies. Hope you enjoy. <laughs> We are joined today by Steve, my usual co-host. Good afternoon, morning, evening, whenever you're listening to this. And we are also joined for the first time by Derek, who is our chief comics correspondent, a title that I made up literally 30 seconds ago before we started recording. Uh, he also contributes editorials to the site, and he's all around a big Godzilla fan, so we decided to bring him in on the podcast as well. Nice to have you, Derek. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So, we're talking monster movies, we're going really broad scope on this, so let's start at the, pretty much the seminal go monster movie, uh, good old Godzilla. So, Derek, why don't you start us off with Godzilla? Oh, I would love to. Alright, so, my experience with monster movies is pretty limited. I watched Godzilla as a kid, and absolutely fell in love with him. Uh, during that time, Godzilla was kind of more of a superhero, and this bit larger than life figure. So it was very exciting to see giant monsters fight each other in a city landscape. There was just something unique about it, something different than most movies, I feel like, at the time. And when I was a kid, there was obviously, like, VHS rentals and things like that. So the box art of a Godzilla movie was always more appealing to me as a kid than anything else. And I didn't really understand the kind of importance of Godzilla, the original 1954 movie, until... I was much older and going back on it, it's actually a very monumental piece of cinema because the original director, his intention was to make this a horror film to kind of deter mankind's scientific research and use of nuclear weapons, nuclear warfare, nuclear energy. And you see that a lot in the original Godzilla film before the American edits where families are running from this creature and it has scenes that mimic Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the untold destruction, even the dialogue and part of the script is to refer back to the nuclear bombings of those areas. Like families say, uh, we can visit daddy in heaven uh, when Godzilla is about to destroy their city. There's burn victims. There's like overall like huge destruction. And the point of the film was to really show that nature is kind of retaliating against mankind's efforts. I mean, obviously as a kid, you don't understand any of that. And from his first appearance in the 1950s, Godzilla's really changed since then. He's, we'll talk later on about how monster movies like were at their peak in 1950. Because of this, Toho, which is the company that made Godzilla, was able to experiment with monster movies and they found that audiences really like the fact that giant monsters can punch each other in the face. So <laughs> we have like movies like Godzilla vs. King Kong, which is a favorite of mine just because it's two, it's like the West versus the East, two giant properties, which if you think about it, doesn't make any sense because Godzilla is the size of like Empire State Building and Godzilla climbs the Empire State Building. But given the uh, movie magic liberties we have there, it's a pretty epic film. And there's a lot of like memorable scenes like King Kong stuffing a tree down Godzilla's throat. 
Oh, that's where that comes from. <laughs> Just like crazy things like that. That as a kid, you like watch with wide-eyed wonder, and you're like, "This is the greatest thing of all time." And I'm trying to think, like, like King Kong versus Godzilla, 1962. Like, what was going on that would warrant a East versus West fight in that sort of way? It, it wasn't like even a, supposed like a Russian to be. thing. It was actually supposed to be Frankenstein. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Uh, you can see like parts of that in the movie where uh, King Kong actually fights like power lines and becomes empowered by that, which is more <laughs> of a Frankenstein thing. Wow. One of the things that you did mention, and this is almost the best time to do it, is so you mentioned how the Godzilla was sort of in reference to nuclear war and some of the scenes were sort of reminiscent of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. One of the things that was interesting, though, was that when the movie was being released to the U.S., there was a good effort to stop that movie from coming, and they were demanding huge edits because United States cinema didn't want... They were worried that this was Japan sort of mm -hmm. blaming the United States for actually dropping those bombs. And it was interesting that a discussion on should we be bombing each other is this sort of look at what could happen. Not necessarily <laughs> we could awake giant lizard creatures from the depths of the ocean but the thing that nature the world will retaliate we should not be destroying our planet like this uh, that conversation was dwarfed by sort of the united states own insecurity about whether or not we should have been bombing japan in the first place and that conversation the real conversation was limited because the united states was so protective of their sort of place in history and ensuring that they are remembered as the people who were almost mm -hmm. correct in their actions. Do you think, um, um the end of like War the II. shift of Godzilla from a monster to a hero represents like the changing tide of how we perceive like nuclear energy and stuff like that, I guess. I mean, like from, from when it, from its conception, which is very much a, a cautionary tale, you could say about using nuclear, you know, weapons and then to, to something that, that could be, a savior potentially i mean i mean that's coming into japan so it's not like you know the u.s is the one that's that's building the bombs to beat the russians and then so of course we, we want to have the the biggest weapon on our side you know uh mm -hmm. but from from japan I'm, i mean i don't know you might have a better perspective i've i've seen the original godzilla i saw the new one and i've seen clips from like everything in between don't have enough information there to back my yeah head. um i would definitely say that i feel like godzilla became a superhero just because of and i know this isn't like a really metaphorical or symbolic reason but i think it's just honestly a business decision mm. because like as i said it turns out audiences really like the fact that monsters can beat the crap out of each other so there's always been that bigger threat and i mean you can see this in like the 1980 godzilla movies where they definitely started appealing to kids. They had a child Godzilla with a kid sidekick or whatever. They had Jet Jaguar, who is basically a Power Ranger in the Godzilla franchise. But at the same time, you can see that all, the, the original message is kind of still there because Godzilla does fight enemies that are products of science. They're products of mankind's pollution. They're products of mankind's overambition to kind of replicate Godzilla to have one they can control. And Godzilla always comes and beats the crap out of mankind, <laughs> whatever. Um, That's pretty much also how the new one mm -hmm. played out in a way, because the, the caution was still against sort of nuclear warheads and nuclear weapons, because that's what the two M Mutos, is that, that was they're called? The, yeah, the Mutos. Big, yeah. Yeah. The Mutos were still very, they liked eating nuclear weapons. And so clearly that was the idea that nuclear energy and nuclear weapons was sort of fueling this bad thing. But we had become so attached to Godzilla as a hero that we said, well, let's just have him counteract the Mutos and fight the Mutos, let him be the nature because he's evolved to the sort of superhero status. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And I think it's also kind of an American audience thing where we kind of like the fact that um, we follow the main character and the, and the main character is the good guy and the good guy is ultimately triumphant mm -hmm. um, versus the Japanese original film where the main character is this monster and nothing anyone can do can ever stop him. And the only way people could stop him was creating a more powerful weapon. And basically the creator of that kills himself using that weapon so that no one else would be able to use that again. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is going back to something we said before of how the American film really edited and changed the Godzilla film to meet their kind of political and kind of public opinion of themselves 
was that uh, the editing, especially in the last scene, is in the Japanese version, they say, if mankind keeps going the way they are, there will always be another Godzilla. Even if this one is dead, there will always be another one that will come back up from our arrogance and destruction. And in the American version, it goes, well, the monster is dead. There's a brighter future ahead of us. They're completely different. One is like optimistic and the other is a tale of caution and warning. Hmm. And um, I mean, I think that's just differences in the the plot. The American re edit didn't like follow like a bunch of like a reporter or something like that. Yeah, it like, followed that was, that was all inserted YouTuber. into the film. Yeah, that he was, was like a pretty famous actor at the time, and basically what he did was he just like narrated the whole yeah. Godzilla film for Western audiences. So there was like very little dialogue. He just like explained everything. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it though. I, en- I enjoyed the original Godzilla. Mm-hmm. And I, I like the new one too. I think in terms of an effective monster movie, like we made the point a little earlier, I like I like that it was sort of grounded in character perspectives. Yeah, you got the big Godzilla smackdown at the very end of the movie, but for most of the time, uh, you really only got it through, you only saw the monsters through a certain character's perspective, which sometimes meant not seeing it at all or only seeing it through a TV screen. And I thought that was really effective as to like what makes, you know, in terms of making a good monster movie. I thought it did a really good job. I'm really glad because it seems like now there seems to be a reemergence of monster films with Godzilla and Pacific Rim. It seems to be moving away again from the original message and going towards like destruction and things like that. And just general spectacle, which is a good, which has always been a big part of, I think, monster movies in general. Is we want to see, we do want to see, you know, the effects of, of monsters beating the crap out of each other or destroying a city. There is just something inherently pleasing about just spectacle and just cool look things that just look cool. I would like to say about the newest Godzilla, what I really liked about it. Godzilla has always been about a nuclear threat, and in the original movie, he comes up and there's bright flames, destruction, everything, trying to mimic kind of the bomb. And in the newest one, when Godzilla first appears, what he causes is a tidal wave, massive flooding, etc. Mm. And what that's trying to emulate was the nuclear meltdowns in Japan a couple years before the movie was released. Oh, showing, that's with the, the, the earthquake, right? Yeah, showing how, like, again, the destruction of nuclear usage, but from a different point of view, and it's more modern. And I, I really like that they incorporated that in the new Godzilla film. Wow, I didn't even think of that. So I guess this might be a good transition point. So one of I I do have a love for 1950s, uh, whether it's sci-fi or monster movies, or just, I just love 1950s movies like that. And one of my favorites, all as a kid and still now, is the movie from 1954 called Them, which is a movie about giant ants. And there's a lot of there's a hundred different things I love about this movie. Um, number one is that they don't. The effects, actually, I'm still decently sold on the effects, despite the fact that it's 1950s. They do a good job sort of hiding the creatures in the shadows and making it scary, and you don't really ever see giant... It's not like there's a giant ant parading through the city, and you sort of say, oh, it's a guy in a suit or it's a puppet. It, but it, they do a good job selling selling it. But it's so... This is almost the United States finally owning up to the nuclear weapons, because this was, as we were getting into the Cold War, um, this was you know approaching the Cuban Missile Crisis, so we were sort of realizing, oh, we should not be using nuclear weapons. And the conceit of this movie, of course, is sort of standard that we were testing nuclear we- weapons, nuclear fallout landed, and an ant hill grew to giant ants. And it's just a really fun movie, and they sort of do what the Godzilla re-edit failed to do, which was actually deliver that cautionary message in a way that is, I think it's more effective, was more effective for an audience at that time because it was sort of us blaming ourselves as opposed to our then enemies blaming us. They didn't want to have Japan blame us, but they could have us own up to the fact that maybe we should be using nuclear weapons. But it's a great movie, and that came out at the height of what I think was a string of fantastic movies were just monster movies and just science fiction in general regarding cautionary tales about war and we see, we see it in the day the earth stood still we see it in the movie tarantula we see it in the movie them um it was in every twilight zone episode for you know a stretch of maybe five six years <laughs> um and that was just sort of the peak i think the 1950s of sort of the monster movie as a means of giving us sort of a cautionary outlook on sort of the direction that foreign policy was shaping that's probably a good segue into talking about like monsters' thematic 
elements instead of uh you know like just being a big scary monster or whatever because um like obviously you know the 50s you had all these cautionary tales and stuff like that but then you have you know it's still preying on people's like fear mm -hmm. you know like it's preying on a fear of either nuclear war or foreign invasion or like the sense of otherness that you're not familiar with but then like you go farther farther out like alien will always be my favorite monster and horror film and it, it's probably like my favorite film of all time just in general like genres aside if i had to pick one and uh i think i mean i mean cautionary tale 2 you want to say 1979 was 10 years after the first lunar landing so like space is still very much in everybody's mind and and what's out there and what are we going to find and the, there's this perfect weapon out there that could destroy mankind and all this other stuff but also in terms of like using it to, to represent other things, like there's plenty of literature and dissertations on like the alien is like a, you know, praise on fear of sexual assault because of these very like phallic imageries and stuff like that, that I think a lot of classic horror movies probably relied on in different ways. But Alien was, was pretty pointed in that. H.R. Geiger's design in particular was known for that sort of stuff. Where else was I going with that? Yeah, Alien is a, is a unique example because you can sort of tie it back to like several different fears. I mean, the f biggest one is obviously sexual assault, but there's a certain amount of, I don't, I don't want to say feminism to it, but it was a unique take on sort of giving a male a fear that a lot of females feared, and in a way that yeah. you have this, you have this egg that was, obviously egg is a symbol of fertility, basically raping its way into a, into a man who's then f unwittingly growing the rape baby, for lack of a better term, uh, inside its stomach that then forcibly r rapes its way out of you. Um, <laughs> this is yeah. violently... Uh, and it's it's interesting because you could say, oh, it's just a rape metaphor, but it's a good way to s almost visualize that fear from men, because men don't really have that sort of understanding of what how a rape could affect you. So it's an interesting sort of way to twist that and tell tell a tale to an audience that normally wasn't sort of hearing that message i think what's so good about that too is that like that's only something you sort of realize when you sit down and analyze it farther it's not like it was out from the get-go and it was obviously this like metaphor you, you don't know, sit I there mean, and like, say oh here's another rape story for you you could right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. like it, it's just sort of like it's the way the monster works and it's horrifying because of this subconscious fear we have not because it's overtly trying to be super disgusting about it because like alien is gross like this really gross stuff that happens in the movie but none of it feels like revolting i guess like there's a difference it, it feels like like tasteful right. horror, you know <laughs> like if there's such a thing um because like it it preys on just the right amount of fears for the right amount of time shows the right stuff and i think it's super effective as a monster movie and um i mean you want to talk about like being invaded in ways that you should not be invaded uh i'm also a big fan of uh the thing the one that came out in 85 I think 82 82 I had it right is 82 I'm a huge fan I've never seen the original one which is a mistake I always want to rectify which was uh who goes there I think which was also based on a short story I'm a huge fan of Russell Crowe no not Russell Crowe Kurt Russell but the sense that like you could become someone you're not supposed to be and uh also this this reflection on like who can you trust who can you not trust how can you tell but also, I like the thing as a monster movie for the way that it broke sort of the rules of monster movies, I think, because it was this sort of amorphous being that you couldn't pin down. So it's not like you figured out a way to kill it and then you sought out to kill it. It was like always evolving and changing and depending on how they went to try and, and kill it, there was always a, a counter that it had, you know, uh, whether it was tentacles or like eating somebody's hands using a defibrillator or like when they're when they're they're handling one issue and then like its head falls off and crawls away and like forms another alien. Like it just, it always had these surprises that I think always keeps it horrifying pretty much right up until mm -hmm. the very end. I don't know if you've seen the thing or if you have an opinion on the thing. I have not seen the thing. You should yeah. see the thing. It wouldn't be a good monster movie if we could kill it so easily. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a difference, I think, between like be like knowing how to kill it and watching them try to do that the whole movie, and then like just getting the crap beat out of them by this monster, and then like in a frantic like it, you know the thing ends very ambiguously, sort of. I mean, that kind of goes back to Alien too, where like you're like oh like like shoot it or kill it or whatever, but then it has like acid blood, which is like <laughs> oh, now we can't even now we can't kill it. Like how do you kill something that has acid blood? So that's like another example of like this 
horrifying, you know, twist on something that isn't, uh, you know, it breaks the rules of what what was established in monster movies previously and sort of even within its own world, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, so speaking of rule breaking, I know you had one other point to mention about breaking the rules. Yeah, Jurassic Park is also one of my favorite movies, and it's a really effective monster movie because it also, I think it has everything. Like if we're looking for a good example of something that has like a cautionary tale to tell a uh, spectacle and also breaks the rules, you know, not not just in terms, it broke the rules cinematically, certainly by actually delivering the stuff on screen, which was always surprising, but also like narratively, you know, like at the beginning of the movie when they're like, like, yeah, they're all female, so they can't reproduce on their own. And then you find out later in the movie that Yes, they can reproduce on their own, and there's eggs and there's baby raptors running around the island. Uh, you know, life fi- finds a way, which you know you could say it's like a twist, but I, breaking the rules to me isn't a twist. It's a way to like you can either heighten the stakes or add depth to the world or discover something surprising that wasn't there before. So I don't think breaking the rules should ever be like a shock, like a sixth sense sort of twist. That's not really breaking the rules, but um, establishing a norm, going along with the status quo for a little while, and then realizing that the status quo isn't what you thought it was can be horrifying uh, or really cool, depending on the movie. And if it's logical, like Jurassic Park was, because it, it was the frog DNA that you figured mm-hmm. out, you know, was it, what did it. Um, it's it's just done. Really and that's well. what I love about those movies. Those movies, I think, pretty much all the movies we've mentioned thus far, is it's not condemning us. I mean, it, obviously, the nuclear war was condemned pretty heavily, but in a way that wasn't quite pointing to a specific thing. Like it didn't tell scientists not to don't clone dinosaurs or don't look into nuclear power or don't do this. It's more of a just sort of recognize your own limitations. Don't think that you are a superior. Don't get arrogant. Don't think that you are control over your, over this planet. Don't. Mm-hmm. It's very, mm-hmm. it's more of a humbling message than anything else to remind you that you are just not, sure. you don't have control over all the elements that you think you do. And that's what leads to the downfall of humanity in a lot of these movies. But I think that's also why Jurassic World probably didn't work for me in terms of not really having this cautionary tale and also uh, handling the monsters poorly. Uh, it didn't break any rules. It tried to. It failed at them. And uh, it never never raised stakes, never raised, raised tension, which is stuff I've been saying forever. But what is your like opinion on both of you guys like like showing the monster, right? Like Jaws is hailed as this masterpiece because the trick didn't work and Steven Spielberg had to not show it as much as he wanted to, which you could say increase attention because you let sort of your mind fill in the blanks. Uh, do you think that's still an effective tactic for filmmakers to follow See, or is that kind of it's done now? weird because when I watch a movie, I recognize that when I remove myself from a movie, I don't want to see the monster, at least until the very end. Because um, I, I think keeping the monster in the shadows is the way that makes you engage because the whole time is like, oh, I want to see this monster. I want to know what it looks like. And that's what I feel when I feel the movie is I want to know. But at the same time, once I see the monster, I'm not scared of it anymore because yes. before I was free to Same. fill in the blanks with anything that scared me in particular. So if I, to finally see, oh, this monster it has 14 eyes. Well, that's, that's not scary. All of a sudden it ruins it for me to see, oh, this is, mm-hmm. he's a stupid thing. But before when it could have, it could have been anything that my subconscious was afraid of that day, keeping in the shadows always works more at scaring me. I think that's interesting too, to go back to the thing in Jurassic Park, like the thing sort of works because it's always changing its appearance depending on what it's like taking over it's, it's always looking different you're not sure what it actually really looks like because it's always taking these bizarre forms and it's always hiding in somebody else's body and uh i think jurassic park also did that well just because you know the raptors they didn't show you initially in the pit and and the t-rex even doesn't show initially and you still see it behind the fence in the rain but by the time you actually do see it though it was so impressive and it's still impressive that i think that's the one time showing the monster <laughs> actually like well the works. other thing about jurassic park and to an extent the movie i mentioned them is that we sort of know what it's supposed to look like so they had they had to right see- Yes, um, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. So they do have to show, but they, and they did a good. But that's why like Alien. I think it was great how little they showed of Alien because that's something that they could have taken in any direction, and to only show a little tail creeping down and a little mouth shooting out a bigger mouth. Um, right. And even the even the times you do see a lot of it, like even in like James Cameron's Aliens, even when you're looking at. It, the whole thing, I still feel like you're not really seeing the whole thing, you know? And that's part of, like, it's still part of, like, it has these secrets that you don't know about, like, the acid blood and stuff like that. Um, but it, it, I don't know, it's just such a weird 
creature design that it blends into the environment in weird ways, like weird natural ways. So you never feel like you're seeing mm-hmm. the whole thing, or it seems bigger than it is. Mm-hmm. You know. So and the only time it, you know when it gets blasted out of the airlock, it's still it's still scary. It's a terrifying yeah. creature design too. Let's say Alien does an exceptional job with the whole like balance of hiding the monster and showing it because um really the crutch of that movie is just the human interactions and things like that. So the fact that you're not really seeing the monster at the same time that the people in the movie aren't really seeing it, you have the same element of fear and um you can see them like deteriorate uh the trust between everyone. And I think that works really well with Alien. And I would say, like, in terms of, like, seeing the monster, like, I feel like it depends on the movie and, like, they have to achieve that balance. But I don't like seeing the monster in trailers, so... <laughs> yeah, Jurassic I, World sinned that hard, man. Yeah, I feel like it It steals the big reveal from the movie, which is really sad for the movie. And I know in the beginning trailers of Godzilla, the newest one, um, people were really excited because you couldn't really see Godzilla. The only fully. really shot you got was when they were closing the door on Elizabeth Olsen, right? Yeah. Exactly. And that was even later. Like, the first one was just them um, doing the halo jump, and you only saw his tail because he was so that's massive. That's such a good trailer. That's, one of my, that's probably one of my favorite trailers of all time, honestly. Exactly. Like, a good monster movie trailer is not one like where they like they kind of like hide the re- and you didn't even know that there was another monster going into the Godzilla until like they released it and they're like oh reviews are coming in and there's another monster in it but I mean there's like an element of surprise that I really like going into monster movies that I don't want them to reveal the monster especially like it just makes the reveal that much more satisfying when you see like the whole thing I actually cannot express in words Derek how much I actually agree with you. Not even in terms of just monster movies, too. Just I think that, tra- and this is going to be a little tangential, but trailers just give so much away now, and it upsets me so much. And that God- that Godzilla trailer, if you could say- compare that Godzilla trailer with the Jurassic World trailer, it's like one of them is clearly more engaging and makes me watch the movie more because it has me interested, mm-hmm. whereas Jurassic World, I'm like, that's, that's a dinosaur. That's probably what it looks like. The... the um. I mean, we had this discussion in, like, one of our first podcasts we ever did or whatever, but, like, trailers that establish tone instead of explain plot are always better. Uh, so, like, that original Godzilla one, you had, like, the eerie music in the background, and you're getting glimpses of, you know, the Halo Brian, jump and stuff Brian like... Brian Cranston's melodious voice. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then, uh, you know, my favorite trailer of all time, to pair with my favorite movie of all time, Alien, does the same exact thing, where it's just... It's just there's no dialogue in the trailer at all, which is incredible. It's it's literally just images from the movie, tone, and like a, a building soundtrack underneath that obviously contributes to the tone. Um, that and it's just so effective, and it, it's really really good. Yeah, showing monsters during trailers is just dumb. yeah, that's bad. Don't do that, directors or trailer <laughs> makers, whoever does the trailers. So I guess the one there's not really a good segue here, so I'll just make my own segue. Speaking of things that are unrelated, (laughs) when it comes to this is the point I'm about to make is a little bit bigger than just monster movies. Um, Speaking of a very specific type of movie here um, and that is movies in which it's sort of a survival element added in. Um, The one I'm thinking of right now the most is Cloverfield but you could see it in pretty much any movie in which you're sort of following a band of five or six normal everyday people as opposed to the military or scientists or experts in whatever field is being discussed um there's a certain degree of wish fulfillment there and i need to make sure i explain this point properly because people will say wish fulfillment well who wants to who wishes that you know their city will get destroyed and that their family will be murdered and all these other things but i say wish fulfillment in that it fulfills a very basic psychological need which is the need to feel needed. Because who's that one character that we all hate in movies? Lambert from Aliens. Yeah. Oh my god, it's the The person who we just say is useless. It's the guy who has the gun in his hand and is too afraid to pull the trigger, or the lady who cries, or just the person who doesn't do anything. That's the person we always hate, and we always are excited for them to die. Counter to that, we love the person who just is just winning nonstop. Usually it's the survivor, but is just beating off hordes of zombies or is jumping, is saving the people from burning buildings in Cloverfield, climbing up that big sort of 
broken skyscraper over Central Park in that really gorgeous apartment. Um, those are the people we always like because we need to feel needed. We like to think that in a situation like this where, you know, all bets are off and heroes are needed, that we are the person who would step up to the plate and that we are the person who would be the hero as opposed to the person who would sort of cower and hide, which, for the record, if a giant alien is attacking a city, that's a valid move to make is just cower and hide um, when your survival gets in. But we like to think that when it comes to fight or flight, that we are going to fight, we are going to fight hard, and we are going to be the successful ones. And I think that's part of the reason why we love monster movies so much, is it gives us sort of internal validation. It sort of tells us, no, don't worry, you will be a hero. You'll be the brave one. Whether or not the movie has any qualifications to say that is another thing. But that's part of the reason why I think we like seeing some destruction on such a massive level is because it makes us feel good about sort of ourselves and what we would do um, in situations like that. Like Jurassic Park is the perfect movie because we can use it for every single example ever. Um, but like the T-Rex scene, you get all of that in one condensed little scene where like the lawyer is the like cowardly guy who runs and leaves the kids, which is like an unforgivable sin in the audience's eyes. Mm-hmm. Like you left children to die. Like, and it, you know, and he immediately gets his comeuppance because the cowardly guy gets eaten like immediately and then you get sam neil your hero coming out with the, f- the brilliant plan to use the flare to distract the t-rex and ends up going and saving the kids so you get this like immediate gamut of like hating a character and wishing they die and then getting that satisfaction and then having somebody else step up to the plate mm-hmm. who doesn't even like kids um it's a you know save 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 the day and save the kid and same same thing goes for the most recent godzilla where aaron taylor johnson's character who I don't remember the name of that character because it was some Bro- Brody Walker some, or something. It was the some, most like American intentionally story. generic yeah. name, I'm sure. Um, yeah. He goes out of his way to save that little boy when they're on the monorail or on the train or whatever that scene was. Mm-hmm. He goes out of his way to save that because that's a very we want to love that character. We want to that's that's wish fulfillment. That's us saying that oh if I if I'm in that situation, this is how I'm going to step up. As opposed to being like, oh, I, I need to save myself or whatever. It's very clear when they structure the heroes that they do it in ways that would be, that tug on our heartstrings and make us feel like this is how I would act in this situation. I think that works really well too for the trim scene because, like, there would probably not be a whole lot of tension there if that kid wasn't also there you know for that for that setup because then it would have just been like, oh, he's just trying to save himself and you know he'll get out because he has to make it mm-hmm. to the end of the movie. But yeah, yeah, I had the kid there, and I also I like the idea of Brody McBland um, being being bland, like like that works. To it's like he's like the Gordon Freeman of movies, <laughs> you know. He's like he's so bland that you can just put yourself in his place and be the hero. Um, and I think there's a larger discussion to have there, especially in regards to video games that let you do that, which would maybe be a good topic for another talk. But yeah, I mean, you get either these uh, stoic, quiet ones that you can sort of project yourselves onto, but then you'll get really, you know, you can also get more interesting characters as well. Both kinds of monster movies, I think, work, you know. You think that's a danger for films, too? Because you don't want to have characters that are too annoying that just survive the whole film and it just detracts from the experience. Especially as a main character. I I really do. Yeah, I really do like Jurassic Park, but the scene of the T-Rex infuriates me because of how just stupid the kids are i know it's like oh but they're kids but like who shines like a flashlight you know like, well she, she, he the lexi didn't know she was trying to see what was out there and then tim immediately tries to get her to turn it off remember mm-hmm. it's like he's like turn the light off turn the light off but then the damage is already done and then they're like shine it right in this oh my god it's just well, like well i think also one. though lex the girl they needed to give her that scene at the end on the computer Otherwise, she would have been that useless. She would have been that useless character. She would have been the one no one likes. So they needed to give her a reason to be useful. This is yeah. a Unix system. I know this. It's I, uh, some weird three D GUI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever. I love Jurassic Park. No one could take that away. Closing points, everyone. I guess. Good monster movies. I think we we hit all the points we wanted to make. Show. Some sort of them- it's a thematic representation of a larger issue that people either fear or are concerned about. Don't show the monster in your trailers uh, at all, <laughs> or very sparingly. 
Um, and have a have a character that you can relate to that is a hero because that's a form of wish fulfillment. One monster movie recommendation that the listeners may not have heard before. Um, any any good ones that you have, Derek? I know you have an encyclopedia of dra- of Godzilla movies. So what's your you want to go original? What's your recommendation if people want to check out Godzilla more or just a monster movie? I would say for a really interesting experience, I would say watch Godzilla vs. the Smog Monster, just because that is it has the most memorable Godzilla scenes in terms of ridiculousness and humor, <laughs> and it's it's basically like a comedy starring Godzilla, so just it's a completely different than the character you'd expect, and after watching that, you'd probably say God, the 2014 Godzilla was the best Godzilla ever. Because it's it's basically a movie that shows too much Godzilla and he does too many things, so I would definitely say that one. Steve, your monster movie recommendation? Uh, probably it's, if I haven't made it clear, probably go with the Thing, nineteen eighty two, not the recent two thousand eleven reboot remake prequel thing. It's up, it's a hundred percent up there in terms of uh, scares. It, it's on par with uh, Alien, I think, in terms of uh, terror and. You know, a lot of our viewer base is, is familiar with aliens, so I don't like it. Uh, but practical effects and, um, you know, just, just thematically, and, and it's just shot really well, and it's got really good music, a bass line. It's, people will love it, the thing. More people need to see the movie. I just got to say, I can't recommend the movie Them enough. Um, they do, they sort of in the way that Spielberg recognized the limitations of the way the shark looked in Jaws, the director, Gordon Douglas, sort of knew that ants sort of look weird. Giant ants would sort of not play well. <laughs> so they do a good job at just keeping the ants in the shadows um, or even just playing sort of just having a little bit of sound effects but not really showcasing them. So the effects, while obviously they're not they're not stellar, I, I could still see how this is a movie. They do an amazing job in a in way of making ants believable having sort of set, setting it up the set design is very, very good because at one point they go into a giant ant nest. That's played very well. And it's, the story is extremely engaging because it's, it's sort of a national conspiracy, it's sort of a national search going on. But it sort of illustrates the tension between sort of science and the policymakers who sort of have the ability to actually make change, which is reminiscent of Everything from nuclear war to global warming to just anything, that, a lot of things that we see in the government. So it's an amazing culmination of things that's still timely to this day. So I cannot recommend the movie Them enough. I will check it out if you check out The Thing. We're going to trade generic movie title yeah. name movies. Them, The Thing. So that was our conversation on monster movies. One of the things that really did interest me in this conversation that we didn't really explore all the way was just the idea of what is the trend here? Are we moving towards? Are we moving away? Where are we going with monster movies in the future? And I really don't have an answer for you on that. You could point to a handful of movies and say, clearly, we're headed towards more monster movies. But then you could sort of look at the trends and say the opposite. So it's really ambiguous, which I kind of like, I guess. I guess it just keeps us on our toes and we'll be surprised as to what Hollywood throws our way next. Anyway, that'll do it for this episode of Nerd Talk. So if you've enjoyed, let us know in the comments down below. Feel free to weigh in on the topics that we discussed. And other than that, for more games, comics, movies, and more, keep it right here on Nerdy Inc.